Back to IMF World Bank Week at the Atlantic Council. We are live inside the IMF HQ1 atrium on day one of the IMF World Bank spring meetings. We are wrapping up day one. We've had a full series of events with finance ministers and central bank governors. More to come tomorrow. But first, I want to talk about key themes of the week. And we're going to bring in some of our senior fellows and experts from the Geoeconomic Center to go through what to expect, both from the World Bank and the IMF, so we can set the agenda and have markers to look for throughout the week. I want to welcome in Amin Mosseni Chiraglu, macroeconomist at the Geoeconomic Center. Amin, we're sitting at the IMF, and protocol being what it is, I want to talk first about the World Bank. We focus a lot at the IMF at right. the Atlantic Council. I worked at the IMF. A lot of our senior fellows did. But let's talk about the World Bank. It's Ajay Bang, a second meetings. He was new on the job yes. when we met in Marrakesh six months ago. What is the key items on his agenda and the World Bank's agenda on the other side of 19th Street? Yes, for sure. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, interviewing Anna Bierde, the Managing Director of Operations at the World Bank. And what, what I heard from, uh, from her is that uh, four main things are on the agenda for this spring meetings and also moving forward. First is, of course, climate issue. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. I walked into the World Bank's uh, main entrance from 18, 18 H Street, and there they have their mission statement. It used to be our dream is a world free of poverty. I remember that well, yeah. Now they have an extra line under it that says, and a livable, unlivable planet. Hmm. Uh, so the climate issue is definitely uh, an agenda, uh, has been an agenda, it's going, to, it's going to remain to be an agenda. The second one is the gender issues, of course, uh, and there has been reversals happening. Uh, there was a report that came out today exactly on great reversal, and what has happened in many of the poorest countries in the world. And of course, on the gender issues, there has been a lot of reversals because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the gains that were made in the past decade basically was all wiped out because of the COVID. So there's a, that's the second uh, uh, issue on the agenda. Uh, the, the, the third one is jobs. Uh, 1.1 billion jobs are going to be required within the next decade. And the global economy is only creating 300 million. Hmm. So you can figure 700 million or 800 million people are going to be looking for jobs and this is not going to be there. So the, the social and the political and also economic impact of that is just enormous for the global economy. And uh, last but not least, uh, we, we heard about this issue of uh, private capital, mobilizing private capital uh, for the global development agenda. Uh, the investment gap in global infrastructure, in uh, achieving SDGs, in energy transition, is in trillions of dollars. Uh, within, the within the next two decades, the estimates are around 90 trillion to 100 trillion of dollars of, of investment gap. And clearly, the public sector, the MDBs and IFIs are not, they don't have the capacity to provide uh, that kind well, of financing. And therefore, then there comes a need of a private sector, right? And But how do you get them engaged? That's a big question that's going to be uh, 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 at, uh, at, at the center of the uh, uh, meetings here. Well, I wanted to ask you about the MDBs. You know, Ajay Benga came in and he talked a lot about working more with the regional MDBs. Yes. Have we seen any progress on that? Is there anything we should look for in the week ahead on that front? We're going to have the president of AIB come later Definitely. this week. Definitely. I think when we compare it to about, let's say, th two or three years ago, there has been a lot of movement on that front. Uh, MDB presidents are actually making an effort to meet at the annual meetings and the spring meetings. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, more cooperation and coordination will happen with the major regional MDBs and also with the World Bank. Uh, but again, to continue on that private sector one uh, issue that you know, uh, Ajay Bango also created the private sector investment lab to bring in the private sector CEOs and executives and get them engaged with the MDBs out there in order to figure out the solution for the investment gap that's out there for the global development agenda. And what else should we look for during the week from the World Bank? Are there specific events they're targeting, announcements? You know, in Marrakesh, there were some specific deliverables they had, but I haven't right. heard as much from the bank here what uh, to look for. I think the, their main deliverables are scheduled for uh, June and July yeah. time area. Uh, I heard, uh, again, uh, from Managing Director of Operations, she mentioned July 1st a few times. <laughs> with the scorecards, of course, with the private sector investment lab, some, in, some initiatives there. And also the idea that, you know, in order to bring in that capital, they are trying to, at, at the bank, uh, to uh, create the guarantees and bring them all of the guarantees in different sectors of the bank under one shop. Mm. Uh, and so that it will be a cafe cafeteria style, uh, menu style, 
you know, uh, 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 options available for clients. In one stop, they go in and they get what they need and they get out. This is what I've heard a lot from the bank, streamlining process. It's exactly. going to be easier to deal with the bank. But exactly. if you talk to the country so far, and we've had several with us yes. so far, I'm not sure that they've seen that yet. Not yet. But it's early days. Exactly. I mean, this takes a long time. Yeah. Uh, and these are huge organizations and institutions. They have decades of legacy of operations behind them, so yeah. making changes happen is going to take some time for it to happen. Yeah. But I, I, uh, what I hear is that President Banga is, is really serious and keen on this um, streamlining the operations at the bank and making it easier for client countries to have access to bank capital. Well, July 1st is a good date to target since it'll be the 80th anniversary exactly. of the Bretton Woods Institution. So yes. I know everyone's circling that date. We're going to yes. have a lot happening here at the council. Definitely, Amin, definitely. thank you so much for everything you. you do to support our work on the Bretton Woods 2.0 project. It's a pleasure. All right. We're going to turn to the other side of 19th thank Street. So thank you, Amin. And I want to bring in my colleagues, Martin Mulheisen and Hung Tran, who will join me up here in a moment. Now, at the fund... There are a series of events to look for this week. Kristalina Georgieva, of course, was just re-upped for a second term. She delivered her curtain raiser with the Atlantic Council just a few days ago. She has another five years ahead of her, just finished her first term. And I want to bring in Martin and Hung, two senior fellows with us. Martin, former director of SPR at the IMF. Hung Tran, former director, deputy director of monetary and capital markets at the fund. Martin, Hung, you've both helped support our work for the years going back at the Brenton Woods 2.0 project and IMF World Bank at the Atlantic Council. We're here now. We're in the IMF. It's a new iteration for our work at the Council. And I want to start with the events that happened over the weekend. Uh, Iran launching an attack against Israel. And I was taken back, Hung, we were talking about this. Six months ago, we were just landing in Marrakesh right when Hamas's terrorist attacks against Israel were happening. Now we're six months later, Iran launching their attacks against Israel. Geopolitics overhanging <coughs> the work of macroeconomics. How much do you think it will affect what happens this week with the ministers and governors or not? Hung, first to you. It uh, should have an impact with the uh, meeting this week because the attack by Iran, in my view, is a big escalation crossing the red line that has not been touched before in the sense that they attack Israel by launching missile and drones from their territory. So whatever, however Israel reacts, uh, if uh, Israel can be restrained in its reaction, it really opens the Pandora's box in the sense that in the future, Tit and tat retaliation will go beyond what we have seen before. So I think that is a very big thing. Um, that complicates the situation by basically keeping oil price really under pressure or mm. upward pressure because we're already going into the weekend with a very tight oil market with the OPEC plus country keeping a, a 2.5, 2.2 million barrel cuts uh, going forward. So I think that high oil price will keep inflation number up already strong in the U.S., will keep U.S. interest rate higher, and that means the dollar will remain strong. And basically, from my point of view, if the IMF and IMFC discuss global economic outlook, what they have not stressed so far, according to the managing director, is the combination of higher oil price and strong dollars, mm. which is very negative for many emerging markets and de developing countries. So in a nutshell, there's a disconnect between what the IMF advised its member to do, that is restoring fiscal buffer and keeping inflation under control by keeping interest rate high for, 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 for the time being. But that means the dollar will remain strong and that in turn will be very negative for the other part of its membership. Yeah. So I think that disconnect has to be discussed. I, I agree with you on the disconnect, and we should talk about it in a minute of why that exists, because the dollar and the Fed rate cuts have just gotten pushed and pushed and pushed, and right. I wonder if it hasn't factored in to some of the papers and models we'll be reading that were finished up a few weeks ago, even within the fund. So I mean, we'll so talk far, about that. So far, what we have heard from, from the managing director seems to be a bit complacent, in my view, yeah. in terms of looking at the potential risk, which I think is building up out there in terms of growth prospect. Well, Martin, let me turn to you on the mm -hmm. geopolitics. You've written about this papers with us at the Atlantic mm -hmm. Council. I was honestly surprised, I said this in Marrakesh, that the ministers demurred so much when asked about what was happening. And I wonder if it's going to be different this time, if there's some lessons learned uh, that you can't w even see, even though, of course, we don't know all the economic realities of this, uh, but there will be economic repercussions one way or the other. Well, we'll have to see. <clears throat> I mean... The broader context is that what we're seeing right now is um, already ongoing for some time, an alliance between uh, Russia and Iran at least, uh, maybe a tacit approval of China what's mm -hmm. going on. 
which is all directed at um, weakening the Western alliance. Uh, it, it's aimed at overstretching the, the fiscal resources. Um, and we see that in a series of proxy wars. Now, the Iran um, element is, of course, another escalation, but markets didn't seem to be too impressed. <laughs> there is a sense that um, while it's now up to Israel, there's a lot of pressure from the U.S. of not escalating further. Um, there's also um, uh, uh, many countries that have an interest in stabilizing things in the uh, Middle East. And so um, unless there is some major step now by Israel, which, you know, who knows whether they're planning something or when they will do it, I think uh, markets have already kind of uh, anticipated that um, things will continue as, as yeah. they, they were. So I don't see this as quite a, a watershed event as the one in Marrakesh. Mm. But what is clear is that um, the risks um, of um, a very prolonged proxy conflict, um, letting aside the, the tail risk of something really heating up into a confrontation where the United States may get involved, um, is, will be with us for some time. So um, it's to be expected that when they write the next outlook um, in the fall, yeah. that something will have happened around or shortly before the time. We just have to live with that risk. Yeah. And um, the problem, of course, is that um, countries are indeed fiscally overstretched, many. Um, and um, the situation is not getting better on the inflation front. The oil price certainly is an important factor. And so um, we'll have to see how this plays out. It, it will mean that um, uh, central banks will get into pressure. On the one hand, they may have to kind of keep interest rates low for kind of just the debt dynamics. Yeah. On the other hand, inflation may be more difficult to tame. And we will perhaps see somewhat lower growth, although, quite frankly, the way the U.S. economy right now is operating <laughs> is quite a surprise. There was another strong uh, number today yeah. on personal consumption. Whether that's all a fiscal-driven uh, development or whether it's just a strong labor market and expectations of further productivity growth, we'll have to see. It's a very kind of difficult decision, uh, situation right now to yeah. forecast in. And um, again, I think last weekend's events, unless they really seriously escalate, which it doesn't look like at the moment, are not quite the watershed that yeah. they were in Marrakesh. And we will revisit at the end of the week. We will see what yes. happens. And Five days can be a lifetime in, <laughs> yes. in economics and geopolitics. <laughs> We've all, words, we will yes. see. We will see. No, but it, it certainly seems that way yeah. at this point. I, you know, what's interesting to me are these ripple effects. We, we go to Marrakesh, the terrorist attacks happen, and then two months later, Red Sea shipping disrupted. You know, mm -hmm. the things that are connected but are hard to foresee and you can't fully prepare for, but do have economic consequences. And those are the risks that the global economy can't afford to take on, given the other pressures it's facing. Yeah, that's precisely what I mean. There, there could be something in, in Korea. Uh, yeah. and there Another be, piece of the puzzle. Yes, yeah. and there could be something, again, uh, around Taiwan. Who knows? Yeah. But we just have to be ready for these events and possibly you know, some more disruptions on yeah. the supply side, um, which just has, is a risk that we have to carry forward. So let's talk about the other key themes to watch for this week. Hung, you brought up strong dollar. This already came up multiple times in our events with finance ministers this morning. It's going to be stronger for longer than right. folks were projecting even a few weeks ago. What kind of pressures does that put on other countries? I think that uh, basically several emerging market countries, including Indonesia, including Brazil, have expressed uh, discontent and unhappiness with the strength of the dollars against their currency. And they have already first time in many years intervene in the foreign action markets to to support their currency. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a big topic for, for those countries. Even Japan is not very happy with the way U.S. interest <laughs> rates are moving. <laughs> a lot of pressure again in Japan to, right uh, now. to a very yeah. low level. And of course, China also experienced the valuation of the yuan. Yeah. So I, I would expect that to be one of the big topics in, in the IMFC discussion. Uh, overcapacity is a big goal, another one. And Yellen has become even more polite. She said that she will discuss it, but under the heading balanced growth. So mm -hmm. instead of over capacity, it's now balanced growth between <laughs> demand and supply, which is a nice way to say it. But basically, it's a big problem for the IMF to, to, to look at and to try to find a way out. Uh, so I think that between those two, the, the another key issue is, is really going back and look at the debt restructuring process. And there's a new element which is completely out of the left view and unexpected in the sense that in New York State, uh, legislature is now pending 
called the New York to amend the New York law for creditor and they, um, <laughs> and borrower law, which really changed the, the the context and the environment for sovereign debt borrowing and investing. Basically, let's say for half of the sovereign bond issue are under New York law, and the other half is under um, uh, London law, British mm -hmm. law. So the New York state uh, legislature is about to pass a law which really changed the whole environment. It, re it said that the governor of the state of New York will appoint a person who will really intervene and act like a um, bankruptcy judge, judge in, the, in the US to say this is the haircut that is appropriate <laughs> and you have to accept it. And he will de determine, he or she will determine if that degree of haircut is sufficient to get the country back into that sustainability. It is really very, very strange. But here's the point. The U.S. government has no authority over New York state law. And since the sovereign bonds are issued under New York state law, it's very difficult to see how Washington can do anything about it. And that really throws the whole sovereign debt round table hmm. at the G20 and the IMF and World Bank out of kilter. The whole common framework is really rendered uh, unoperable. So I think that is a big problem that uh, G20 really should look at and uh, working with the U.S. government to see how they can deal with that. But it's, it, it's a big problem. This is such an interesting point. It's taken us three years of wrangling with China to yeah. get to some breakthrough. And now, with we have New York State <laughs> and now we have New, New York, York State. State I don't think this is the first time I've done an IMF meeting where New York State legislature has come up as a factor. So this is a first <laughs> for us, Hug. Thanks for flagging it. Martin, I want to turn to you on this mm -hmm. divergent growth point that you raised. The U.S. very strong, but really an outlier compared to most other economies in the world. And now we see that the ECB likely to hike before the Fed. I mean, that would not have been predicted a few months ago. Yeah. To reduce rates, yeah. yeah. To reduce, mm -hmm. to cut. Yeah. So uh, how does this, uh, you know, this divergence going to play out across advanced economies and emerging markets? Well, I mean, first of all, I think the central banks need to do what is in their mandate, which is to maintain price stability. And I think the Fed is right to be cautious. We're seeing some um, unpleasant developments on the inflation front, nothing alarming, but um, I think markets who thought that there may be a quick uh, reduction in rates may be disappointed. Yeah. Um, in Europe, growth is faltering a bit uh, because of all sorts of domestic reasons, but also uh, the China connection, which is probably stronger than for the US. So maybe there's some room to cut. Now, clearly that has implications, um, again, for the uh, exchange rate that uh, Hong mentioned and all the related um, issues that go along with it. But we should not kind of, uh, kind of um, impose on national central banks um, to kind of operate out of their mandate. These are normal fluctuation in interest rates and um, we'll have to see how it plays out. Just on the, um, on the issue that uh, Hung mentioned, the New York law, yeah. I mean, that goes back to Judge Greaser's mm. uh, 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 ruling on the Argentine debt, which yeah. also kind of threw um, um, global debt markets yeah. into a bit of a limbo. I mean, the risk here is clearly that um, uh, borrowers who um, may want to issue don't go to the New York marketplace anymore. They might either go to London or um, they may get to another U.S. state. Mm -hmm. And while one could say, well, you know, what's the big deal, whether you issue in Delaware or Texas or Wyoming? The problem is, of course, that you have that infrastructure to yeah. deal with um, yeah. Um, with uh, borrowers and with the debt restructuring in New York. There's, there's a whole universe of yeah. legal and financial firms that have experience in that. And you would lose that. And that would really throw a lot of uncertainty into the picture. So I think it is a big issue. Um, it comes probably from the frustration in some in New York that China has not moved. And so they're taking now the law, <laughs> literally, yeah, in and their own hands. Their own hands. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I hope that cooler heads will prevail. Okay, we'll watch well, it closely. The, the this intention week. is one thing, but it really will end up hurting the developing countries that the authors of this proposed legislation wanted to help. Right. In the sense of the uncertainty that uh, I agree with, with Martin, that in the interim uh, market will move to London or elsewhere, but the interim period will be filled with uncertainty, uh, untried environment, and that will uh, increase the borrowing costs to emerging market countries. So it end up hurting the countries right. that they want to help.
So, Hung, I want to talk about deliverables for the week. When we were in Marrakesh, there was a lot of markers that had to be met. There was quota reform, you know, things that were kind of were driving the week. What is it this week that we should see from the fund, if anything? Well, I would expect to see um, the fund refining a little bit the, uh, the uh, global economic outlook and advice, taking into account the latest developments. And in my view, it's more serious than people uh, are thinking about. It. That's number one. The quota reform is opening up in mm -hmm. the sense that uh, the, the board approved the quota increase. And now we look at reform to redistribute the share of the voting share and, and quota among countries. But I have to caution that even the increase in, in, in quota is not a done deal because it is subject to ratification by countries. Uh, the U.S. included in its uh, budget for this year, 2024, for going forward. But in my view, um, Congress will likely not appropriate money to make it good. And if it doesn't appropriate money this year, then if Trump is elected next year, mm. then we have to wait four more years or five more years before the issue come up again. To throw the whole process to, to say, into to, question. To put yeah. in a, a, another word, without the U.S., the whole quota increase will not become effective. Yeah. And therefore, instead of having the money now, the fund may wait four years, five years, during which time the arrangement to borrow on a bilateral basis will expire by the end of this year. So I can see there's a real risk that the fund will fall short of its lending capacity well below the $1 trillion mm. that it has now. That's and, a good and one that's something flag. that they, they really have to uh, yeah. fight a way to deal with. Martin, on your agenda, what else? What are the big things we should be looking for this week? Um, I'm not expecting to come much to come out from, from those meetings. Um, there is a lot of disagreement behind the scenes. Um, I mean, for one, we talked about the geopolitical issue, so um, a lot of energy will probably be used to um, negotiate language in the communique about how to characterize the the, the uh, military events and the wars in, in Ukraine and Gaza. There will not be an agreement most likely, so we'll have another chair statement. On the quota, um, yes, I do share uh, Hong's concern about uh, ratification. Um, but the next step, even if, say, even if that progresses, and let's not forget that the Trump administration did agree to an increase in the That's new arrangements point. to borrow, yeah. which was fresh money from yeah. the U.S., which is now being converted into a quota, yeah. or may not. Um, but uh, apart from that, the next step would still be uh, a paper and, and, and negotiations about how to reallocate quota shares, and that would start presumably with a review of the IMF's formula. And that runs in so many geopolitical <laughs> constraints that it has been an obstacle for the last 10, 15 years, and it will remain an obstacle for quite some more time to come. Because um, there's a lot of uh, internal rivalries in Europe. There's a lot of rivalries between other countries in Asia and how they are rated relative to someone else. And it's almost impossible to disentangle unless there's really a, a big consensus. This is a huge risk to flag for the yes. week, potentially. So I would expect that there is some marginal announcements about the IMF's debt work. Um, perhaps some more steps toward um, how to um, uh, how to how to make the uh, common framework more effective and what the IMF can do, and then there's going to be, I'm sure, a big discussion about um, financial uh, help for uh, low-income and developing countries, such as um, the discussion about surcharges. That's, the IMF that's going to be my final question on yeah. surcharges. Um, you read my mind. Let's talk about it. Yeah. And well, for our audience that isn't as familiar, so. Um, IMF lending rates are tied to what's called the SDR rate, which is really a, a weighted average of um, the countries who are in the SDR. So like, for example, the United States, the euro area, China, the UK, among others, and Japan, of course. Um, so you take the, 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 the short term rates, you make a weighted average, and that's your lending rate um, for, um, for the IMF, um, except for countries that um, uh, have a larger amount outstanding for longer time. There are some surcharges that are being applied. And with the, with the market rates as they are right now, after the COVID inflation, uh, some countries are paying 8% or so on IMF loans, which is still much cheaper that, than what they could get at the market. <laughs> but um, it is quite high, yeah. given that lending rates were down at you know, 2 or 3% uh, maybe for a long time. So there's now initiatives to reduce those uh, surcharges which some countries don't like because it contributes to the IMF's reserves and income. 
Um, so there will be some discussions on that. There will be discussions about perhaps more SDR allocations to uh, provide a bigger pot for things like the RST, so the uh, uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust lending, the PRGT, yep. so the, the loans for low-income countries, and also perhaps uh, if some magic formula is found how to facilitate it for uh, multilateral development banks that would also benefit from SDR-related funding. Um, these are difficult issues, not the least because some countries resist it because they feel it's central banks really financing uh, multilateral spending. Um, but um, I don't expect any breakthroughs, but it's going to be discussed, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll follow it throughout the week. Hung, I want to turn to you and then Martin, final words, things we haven't talked about that everyone should be watching. Well, I think that we cover a lot of ground, and so uh, I don't think that we have uh, much uh, to, 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 to add to this. But back to the issue of surcharge, I just want to uh, flag the point that Ukraine, since the war started in early 2022, they have been paying money to the IMF, not receiving any money from the IMF, even though they got an IMF <laughs> program. Incredible in statistic. The in the and we have Ukraine's so deputy so finance minister so every with year us they tomorrow, have to pay money, so we'll and, and not, even yeah. though they are in, 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 in a very serious situation from a fiscal point of view and the war and so on. Yeah. So the reform of the surcharge or the removal of the surcharge is something that I think the U.S. would would push very strongly because the U.S. has a vested interest yeah. in, in mobilizing uh, financial support for Ukraine. That's a great point to raise, and we will ask it tomorrow when we have Ukraine's Deputy Finance Minister with yeah, us. Yeah, it's an important point, question. yeah. The um, one thing that, sorry, who yeah, you wanted? Yeah, I have to say something about the World Bank. I know, I know you yeah. wanted to say yeah. something World Bank. The Go for it, and then, and, and then, then, uh, then uh, okay. Go ahead, Martin, and then okay. a last word on the World Bank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We'll return well, to the World Bank where we started. We started with the bank, yeah. and it's good. Yes, yes, okay. So, um... The one thing that I found interesting, which um, people haven't talked so much uh, about, is uh, if you look at the curtain raiser speech that was at the Atlantic Council by the IMF's managing director, the word climate didn't appear so much hmm. in it. Right. It was a very point. macroeconomic speech. And I found that remarkable because her tenure was just extended yeah. by another term. Um, she has always emphasized the work on climate and developing countries the last five years yeah. during her tenure. And I suspect that behind the scenes when the board decided about her continuation, there may have been some voices that said, well, we should do more about hmm. economic surveillance, which is really the yeah. IMF's contribution to macroeconomic stability. It's an ongoing debate yes. within the fund and externally yes. about the and fund's mandate. Yes, yeah. and she has been criticized for yeah. not speaking enough. So I found it very interesting and positive that finally there was a speech that almost exclusively um, dedicated itself to yeah. describing the global economy. And I would wish, and I hope the shareholders uh, encourage her to do so, that the fund is much more pointed about what countries should do in terms of economics. Because so far one got the impression that it's kind of been relegated to a secondary topic mm. because getting financing for all these valuable reasons was, I think, clearly a priority. So that may have shifted. We'll see how it unfolds. We'll see the tone throughout the week. And it does I, take me back to Undersecretary Shambaugh's speech, Undersecretary of Treasury, mm -hmm. who gave a speech yes. right before the Marrakesh meetings about the fund's mandate, echoing yeah. some of those themes. And yes. you do start to see it reflected, but we'll see. Hung, final word on the bank. On the bank. I think that uh, one really should uh, flag and bring to public discussion one big thing about the World Bank and also the international community in the sense of they want to mobilize finance to help poor countries to deal with their climate change and make the transition to green economies. Great. But they are not able, willing, in the position to put up money hmm. to increase capital to the bank and the MDBs. So they say, look, we will mobilize private capital. We put up public investment, $1. We expect to mobilize 5 to $10 of private <laughs> investment so we have a huge amount of money to help poor country. But it is really wishful thinking. Uh, the IAF, my former uh, organization, just came out with a research today saying that they look into the numbers and they conclude that for every $100 the MDBs commit, they mobilize 15, one five, 15 dollars of private sector investment. So the ratio is 0 0.15, hmm. not five times, not 10 that's times. That's a big difference. So I think that's, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, they are what they are. Yeah. But I think it is very important for leaders and for the World Bank to be realistic, 
to present the real numbers on the table so that everyone recognizes the situation. And if there's a need to really come forth and, and make contribution, then they know where to begin. But to say we can mobilize five times or 10 times private sector investment is really pipe dreaming. And I think that is a very important message that has to be getting through to the World Bank and to their shareholders. And if I may say, yeah. I agree with whom. If I may say, it also needs to get to the IMF mm. because for the private sector yeah. to come in, you need countries that are really working on improving the investment yeah. climate and showing investors a growth potential so that you know, they will be able to get repaid. And I think that's another focus where the IMF needs to work on. Martin Hung, thank you. We'll stay with it throughout the week. We'll check in at the end of the week yeah. to see how the predictions panned out. I want to thank everyone for joining us on day one of IMF World Bank Week at the Atlantic Council. We have a full lineup tomorrow, including, as we mentioned, Ukraine's deputy finance minister in a special event on the status of the dollar at the world reserve currency and how sanctions may be impacting the dollar. So stay with us. You can find everything on the Atlantic Council website, IMF World Bank. We wish everyone a great rest of the day.